Hello, I'm Tom Lamarand. Welcome to Nation to Nation. Kinder Morgan's Trans Mountain Pipeline has divided First Nations, created a possible trade war between provinces, and imposed a May 31st deadline to clear all the obstacles to its construction. Opponents vow to stop it dead, while the Trudeau government insists it will be built, including toughening up legislation to do just that. We are actively pursuing legislative options that will assert plus reinforce the Government of Canada's jurisdiction in this matter. After a two-week break, it's time for our political panel to debate Kinder Morgan. Welcome to Nation to Nation. So uh, since you're new here, I'm going to start with you, Mr. Wilkinson. Uh, Prime Minister and Minister of Natural Resources have vowed this pipeline is going to get built. Uh, we've heard that Kinder Morgan now thinks it's untenable. How are you going to push this through the opposition on the ground, especially Indigenous people, and some of the legal challenges from the province of BC and First Nations? Well, you know, this is a project that went through exhaustive environmental reviews. It was approved by the federal government. It was approved by the provincial government. Um, and in that context, our view is that it, it has the appropriate approvals to proceed. Um, clearly, there are folks that have some concerns. Uh, we believe that we've addressed those concerns in a number of different ways through the Pan-Canadian Framework on Climate, through the Ocean Protection Plan, but also through the, the consultations that we actually conducted with Indigenous communities. And, and clearly, Indigenous communities are important in this discussion, um, but I think it's important to recognize that there's not unanimity on this issue. There are 43 out of 51 First Nations that have signed impact benefit agreements. There are a number of chiefs that have come out in strong support of this project. And so, as with the rest of Canada, there's not unanimity, but we believe that, that the appropriate consultation has taken place, and it's time for this to move forward. Uh, Ms. McLeod, of course, the, the opposition, uh, your leader is, uh, and other members in question period have continually asked, when is this going to be built? Uh, you've heard that the, they are going to build it, uh, so what's the, the general beef right now? You know, I want to go back to what you said about Indigenous opposition, and I think what you first need to do is look at the m map of the pipeline route and the communities along that, including in the area that I represent, who have actually signed off and and I can use some quotes from like Chief Le Bourget as an example he says we worked hard for the first five years we didn't talk very effectively we negotiated an agreement that we're comfortable with so I think the vast majority on the actual pipeline route this is the title and rights holders this is not the UBCIC which they clearly say again Chief Le Bourget and many others we are a member of UBCIC but they are not the titles and rights holders they, it is our decision. So where you end up with some controversy is, of course, when you hit the coast, and and the issue appears to be that there'll be one extra tanker approximately a day, and the concerns around ocean protection. But to sort of suggest that the the vast majority of title and rights holders don't support this project, I think, is actually quite inaccurate. Uh, Mr. Stewart, you've heard that. Is it just a minority, a noisy minority uh, that are causing I, I think the, that, that this pipeline might uh, not get built? Right. I, well, I think it's unfortunate the narrative that's developing here. Uh, really, the biggest enemy of this pipeline is the National Energy Board itself. Uh, the, uh, there's a third of the route yet to be approved. Uh, the company has just applied to push all those hearings uh, well uh, many months ahead of time. Uh, so we probably won't get final approval until 2019. There's 157 conditions to be met, National Energy Board conditions. Uh, the company has only met half of those and they haven't applied for 50 <laughs> to be considered. Um, and then we have the court cases. Uh, we talk a lot about the BC reference case that's coming, but there's these Federal Court of Appeal cases, which uh, First Nations, of course, are deeply involved in because we don't have treaties. <laughs> in much of British Columbia and nowhere along the pipeline route in British Columbia. So uh, consent is important here. And it's consent from every nation that's along the pipeline because we know one nation cannot speak for another nation when it comes to their title and rights. And so uh, I think there's a, an attempt to vilify First Nations people, but that's not the case at all. The company itself is failing. So and they like to blame First Nations that for it. Every single First Nations in the province of British Columbia needs to give consent for this project to go through? Every nation that's affected by this pipeline that goes through their traditional territories because we don't have treaties. So, so have it's to get essentially consent. in British Columbia, what you are saying is that there will never be another natural resource project that goes forward because you can never, when you have these cross boundary issues, you know, you can't get 100%. Sometimes the government has to make a decision but, based on what. Right 
the vast majority, what is good for the vast majority sure. of both Canadians, the, what about the rights of the communities that work so hard? There's I just, just want to jump in, of course, there have been yeah. court cases about this, about the duty to consult, sure. and they've said that uh, there doesn't mean there's a veto, though. It, so it, one, one First Nation not, can't veto, right? The, the cases have not been settled. There's this thing called the Federal Court of Appeal <laughs> that is hearing, currently going to rule soon on at least 15 cases that involve nations that have traditional territories along this pipeline route and I think it's responsible for us to wait until those cases are decided and of course if they're not, if they are decided uh, and the federal government loses they can always appeal to the Supreme Court and I think where this is going to wind up. You know, the jurisprudence to date would tell you that it's extremely <laughs> important to consult and to consult deeply and to, to understand the concerns and to try to accommodate but it is not a veto for every community, um, and and that's that's the same uh, whether it's First Nations communities or, or other communities. The the, there is a duty to consult. Absolutely, there is a, an important duty to consult. But the jurisprudence is pretty clear on this. But why not wait uh, till the federal court has decided one way or the other? Well, this <laughs> this process has been going on for many years now. Um, at a certain point, when a project has actually gone through the appropriate approvals process, as this one did, both federally and provincially that you have to be able to actually say to the proponent that you can proceed. I mean, at the end of the day, Canada has to be open to investment. And if we actually have projects that are approved federally and provincially, that, and, and the proponent has actually moved forward and spent significant sums of money on them, and somehow the rules of the game fundamentally change because the provincial government decides that it wants to wade into federal jurisdiction, that just, that just can't stand. Um, now, Mr. Stewart, I mean, how do you balance the environment with the demands of, from industry for certainty? Uh, again, we heard in the House, and I heard in a committee discussing Bill C-69, that foreign investment has dropped off the map in Canada. Right, but this still doesn't override constitutional rights, right? That, that's, the, that's the thing no, here, is that we have the Constitution of 1867, we have the Charter of 1982, mm -hmm. that's the fundamental law of the land. The Federal Court of Appeal will decide whether or not this process abided by those uh, two very important documents and we, we need to wait until we can't prejudge and parliamentarians are, are of course bound by the court decision so we'll, we'll find out soon enough. And I, I do want to express concerns when you know the NDP and others are very dismissive of the hard work that many of the First Nations communities along the pipeline route have done in terms of this company came to them years before they actually put their application in. They have spent years at the table, they've negotiated hard, and they see enormous opportunity in terms of lifting their communities up, revenue opportunities. One small community alone is looking at a 600,000 per year plus opportunities for jobs plus a benefit agreement so you know what these are small communities it's all very well you know for people in Vancouver who have pretty good incomes to sort of say we don't want an extra tanker a day but look at these communities um, especially some of these First Nations communities are really um, they are believe in the environment they've ensured in their negotiations with Kinder Mountain or Kinder Morgan that many environmental protections that were important to them were put in place including and especially the salmon. They watch trains go along their route. Um, they know that softwood lumber is not getting to market because the trains that are going along the route are filled with um, oil, which you don't have any control over once it hits the, the port. So, so the pipeline is to them absolutely essential and I do want to sort of yeah. give... Before we run out of time though, I want to ask this. I mean, uh, how, are we, how are we going to solve, I suppose, the problem on the ground uh, if there's thousands of protesters who won't let trucks go in or won't let a piece of pipe be put into the ground, uh, are, are you suggesting that there should be mass arrests, for example? I'm not suggesting there should be mass arrests. I think, you know, Canadians celebrate <coughs> the, the, the free democratic society we live in and they celebrate the fact that there is a right to protest in a peaceful and lawful way. I don't think Canadians would be accepting of the idea that people would be, would be breaking the law to try to actually uh, undermine a, a, a project that's actually been approved. But certainly peaceful protests that are done in a lawful way, I think everybody is, is fine with that. It's part of the democratic process. Uh, Mr. Uh, Stewart, of course, you yourself was arrested with the uh, Green Party leader Elizabeth May just a few weeks ago. Uh, I mean, what would happen if there are mass arrests? Well, I've been working on this file since 2011. Uh, the day after I was elected on May 2nd, I, the company called me and I met with them four times. I've consulted my community, uh, you know, phoned every household. We had a vote. 
they seventy five percent said they didn't want this pipeline so i've been doing my best as a parliamentarian to make their voices heard however when the natural resources minister threatened to use the army on british columbians then i realized this had a different place that when when you threaten to use the defense forces to to push a project through against the will of communities violating a constitution ignoring consent then i think it takes the debate to a whole other level uh, Ms. McLeod, uh, is that the way to go? Send in the army? You know, I have to agree in terms of lawful protests is certainly part of Canada democratic process and the, the rule of law needs to be respected. Uh, again, uh, um, Mr. Wilkinson, uh, does uh, Mr. Trudeau have to have a just watch me moment to get this pipeline actually built? Well, I think the Prime Minister has been very clear um, that, that this project is, is in the national interest and it needs to be built um, and we intend to ensure that, that that is done in a thoughtful way, concurrent with implementation of our climate program, concurrent with the implementation of the Oceans Protection Plan and concurrent with ensuring that, that Indigenous communities are involved in a substantive way through things like the monitoring committee that is going to monitor the implementation of the conditions and the ongoing operation of the pipeline, a process that was co-developed with Indigenous communities. Does that mean sending in uh, the RCMP or the Army? Though? No, I mean, I, I have great faith in, in Canadians. I mean, Canadians, uh, Canadians, even those that are opposed to the project, believe in lawful protest. Um, but, you know, I, I think we all expect people to abide by the rule of law. I wish we could go on. Uh, this has just been a great discussion, but we can't. I want to thank you for joining me here on Nation to Nation. Thank you. After the break, a parliamentary committee is studying the way projects, like pipelines, are reviewed and approved. Welcome back. A parliamentary committee is studying Bill C-69. It promises to revamp the environmental regulatory process on resource extraction projects to provide more room for consultation from the public and First Nations. Bill Namangus appeared before it to give the Northern Quebec Cree Nations advice on the proposed legislation. But it has sometimes been seen as a battle between jobs and the environment. Conservative MP Robert Sopuk had this to say when questioning the West Coast Environmental Law Association. This toxic regulatory pro process that is pancaked, that, that this bill is pancaked on, threatens communities, peoples, and li livelihoods. I read somewhere an interesting saying, you give a person a livelihood, you give them a life. Why is it, Ms. Johnson, that you and your groups never talk about the importance of livelihoods? And joining me now is Bill Namagoose of the Cree Nation government of Northern Quebec. Welcome to Nation to Nation. Thank you. Now, what was the main point of your testimony before uh, the committee yesterday? Well, we have an agreement we signed in 1975, which is a treaty. And inside that treaty uh, is an environmental review process. And it was the first of, of its kind in Canada. And Canada is part of that, that process. And our, our request simple is very simple. Uh, we want a new legislation, Bill C-69, to accommodate the, uh, the uh, environmental review process in our, in already embedded in our treaty. And it, it, that review process in our, in our treaty ensures uh, Cree participation on, the, on these uh, decision-making panels. We're not observers, we're not uh, interveners, we're participants. And that's uh, a treaty right that we would like protected and recognized by this uh, new legislation. Are you saying that up until this point it hasn't, they haven't been using this panel? No, we've been negotiating with them for uh, uh, eight years now trying to get the, uh, our treaty embedded in, or recognized in their process, and uh, we have not been successful. Now with this new legislation, we, would, we, we want the same thing, the same accommodation. Uh, how can Cree participation be included uh, without bogging down the process and uh, uh, creating uncertainty for industry investment? Well, this uh, review process, Section 22 of the James Payne and Quebec Agreement, uh, has been around for over 40 years. And it is assess the major, major projects, large, large projects in, in, in the James Bay Northern Quebec Agreement territory. So it's worked. There's been pro projects approved, and the Crees have been participants, not observers. Of course, we have Crees that are, uh, you know, we have representation on the panel, and of course, the Cree are part of the public. But the Cree representatives are part of the process. That's what we'd like to, like to continue. Now, the discussion yesterday got a little bit heated uh, with Conservative MP Robert Sopak. He called C-69, a toxic regulatory process. I mean, how fair was that? Well, it's not fair at all. Uh, if you want development in, in, across the north, in Ontario or in Quebec, 
you need an environmental review process and that has to be fair that includes the people and we have that the process already in, in our in our in, in our case I noticed the, uh, the the MPs didn't ask me any questions nor ask me to comment I tried to comment they turned off my microphone uh, the Liberal Party seems to have this in control uh, they don't want any of the accrued participation or that seems to be the objective and that we decided clearly decided before the hearing that we would just read our statement and it would be ignored after and we, we were able, able, not able to interject. Uh, was there a point uh, in the discussion where you tried to interject and you couldn't? Yes, uh, there were some comments made by the Liberals. Uh, they were <coughs> going back and forth with the environmental, environmental, committee, uh, environmental uh, groups uh, at the table. We tried to interject, uh, I tried to interject, and our lawyer tried to interject, and our microphones were turned off. The, uh, the Liberal Party made a comment about Bill C, uh, a legal comment about Bill C, uh, 68, the Fisheries Act, accommodating Aboriginal people, but it's not true. We want to be in the review process as per our treaty, not as per policy. Policy is at the discretion of the government, and treaty is a constitutional uh, right. We have a right to be there. Now, again, I want to bring back uh, Mr. Sopak's comments. Uh, he also used First Nations in his argument that the process could threaten lives and livelihood. Uh, do you feel he was going, to, going a bit of crossing the line? We, we, uh, we have the opposite experience in the, in the Crees, uh, where an environmental review process and social impact process has created jobs for Crees, and uh, we are involved in the development of the, of, the, of, the, of the territory. There's been peaceful development in the James Bay ter territory. Jobs have been created for Crees. It was because of the environmental review, not in spite of it. So that we experienced the opposite of what, he, what he's saying. And we also noticed that he didn't ask us any questions either. But he read it from a, uh, a, prepare, uh, a chief's comment supporting development. Uh, I think that it was directed to us. He knew that there was an Aboriginal group there. So That's he right. would make these comments directed at, uh, uh, because we were there, but not he directed at us. He was referencing uh, he was the uh, testimony of Chief Ernie Cray, who was there the day before. Yes, in support of development. We are not anti-development either. We, we support development if it respects our rights. Uh, now, you, again, you talked about uh, this process. You, you talked about uh, being a full member of the process, uh, of being a member of regulating or advising on any projects. Uh, if they had done that on the West Coast, I hate to bring it up, but uh, we know what's going on on the West Coast. Could we have avoided some of the conflict that's going on out there? Yes, if you involve Aboriginal people in your, in your processes, uh, <coughs> it creates more harmony than, uh, than a conflict. Uh, uh, we, we've noticed that in our, in our area, uh, we've had dealings with Hydro-Quebec, uh, forestry companies, uh, aluminum, uh, nuclear uh, uh, uranium companies, and the process they have in place has, has worked. We had the last major project we had was uh, in the Territory Hydro project, was a $7 billion project, and it was a hydro project that diverted the Rupert River. And the Crees were part of the environmental review process. Uh, the permit was given, it was not the... The Crees have, uh, no, uh, we have uh, our own debates. Some people oppose it, some people against, uh, are in favor of it, but we come to a consensus. And, uh, it's not all, it's 100% in favor. We have detractors, uh, but the Crees make the decision, decision. And it was through this environmental review process that we did that. We did that. Well, there obviously there wasn't any consensus, consensus on the West Coast uh, when it comes to Kinder Morgan. Uh, Mr. Namagus, I want to thank you for uh, coming on Nation Nation and talking to me. Thank you. Thank you for having me. We've got you now. Coming up after the break, we talk to a Kinder Morgan protester who was arrested and got his day in court. Welcome back. So far there have been 140 arrests at the gates of Kinder Morgan's tank farm in Burnaby, BBC. Recently they had their charges upgraded from civil contempt to criminal contempt. And that could carry a jail sentence. They finally had their day in court. And outside of the courthouse, there was a rally of supporters. We spoke to one of the people who was arrested last month. And join me now is a former humanities professor at Simon Fraser University, Mr. Ian Angus. Welcome to Nation to Nation. Thank you. Nice to be on. Uh, so what happened to you in court today? Well, uh, today was more interesting because uh, more people got a chance to speak up. Um, and... Uh, um, there was a native woman who uh, asserted the, uh, the lack of jurisdiction due to the fact that these are unceded territories and um, a number of other concerns. It gets buried in a lot of, um, 
just organizational stuff a lot of the time. Uh, why do you feel you shouldn't be crim criminalized for protesting up there? Yes, well, you may be interested to know that there should be a statement out from those arrested this spring quite soon, next couple of days. And one of the things that we want to say there very strongly is that we are not criminals. We're basically citizens of uh, British Columbia and the Lower Mainland here who want to show our solidarity with the Sailwatooth people um, who've lived here for many thousands of years and who are trying to protect the inlet. We live by the inlet too and uh, we want to protect it as well. Uh, how did you get arrested? Uh, just uh, tell me a bit about the circumstances around your arrest. Well, I was standing up there on uh, 24th of March with about, I think it's 63 other people actually. Uh, and uh, we were standing in front of Kinder Morgan's uh, uh, entry where the trucks go in. And um, nothing actually m much happened in the sense of they weren't trying to put trucks in that day. They seem to be able to just, well, they, they can decide whether they want to go in that day or not. So it's up to them. So there was no uh, uh, actual truck stopped, but we were arrested anyway uh, for going into the area that the, uh, the injunction says we're not supposed to be in. Do you feel uh, you and uh, other people who've been arrested have been treated differently than uh, those two MPs that have been arrested, uh, Green Party leader well, uh, Elizabeth right. May? Yeah, that's a matter for concern because I think we're all uh, doing what we can in our different ways. And uh, uh, we, there's a strong feeling that we should all be treated in the same way. To single people out and be particularly punitive towards them, I think, is a, a miscarriage of justice. And uh, I, don't think that, uh, I don't think that's fair at all. Uh, if criminal charges are laid, uh, would that affect uh, how you protest in the future up at the uh, Camp Cloud? Well, I guess uh, everything depends on what happens, right? But uh, criminal charges are laid. That's, uh, that's already happening. The trial will begin probably next week. Um, and so uh, uh, I think a lot depends upon what other people do now. Um, it's not wise for any of us to go up there and do this again at the present time because the penalties would be much more severe. Uh, but there are a lot more people who live around here and a lot more people who are concerned. So I think that uh, the important thing is that um, other people do what they can do uh, to stop this Kinder Morton pipeline. What I'll do in the future, I, I haven't decided yet. Uh, so do you think, it uh, doesn't sound like yourself, but do you think other people would risk being a, uh, put in jail over this? Well, other people have. Uh, we all have risk put it, being put in jail of this, for this. and. Uh, uh, there doesn't seem to be any, uh, anybody stepping forth with any kind of real solution to the situation. So uh, I wouldn't be at all surprised if, um, if things go on pretty much the way they have. Mr. Angus, I want to thank you for your time. Okay, well, thanks very much. Uh, thank you for your interest. Next week, Nation to Nation is going on the road. We'll be coming to you from British Columbia, ground zero of the battle over Trans Mountain. I'm Todd Lamoran. Have a great evening.